Thank you for that introduction. So, driven by the twin forces of globalization and mass urbanization, cities around the world are taking on novel territorial forms, stretching our inherited definitions of city and urban much as they stretch outward geographically. In the familiar metaphor of urban theorist Henri Lefebvre, the urban is simultaneously imploding and exploding, both agglomerating inward into dense cores and expanding outward to ever more distant hinterlands. Elaborating on Lefebvre's metaphor, today one can trace a double process of explosion. On one hand, the city has burst the bounds of centralized models, stringing together expanded networks of urbanization on a territorial scale. While on the other hand, this explosion has often taken the form of a fragmentation, splintering the image of the singular city and into zone and enclave geographies on a much smaller scale. This combination of a simultaneous ex expansion and fragmentation of the urban is what I hear and refer to as an atomized urbanism. Perhaps nowhere is this atomized urbanism more evident than in rapidly growing, rapidly urbanizing India. Following the liberalization of the Indian economy in the early 1990s, the growing role of international capital in Indian society has had profound effects on its physical and ideological landscapes, with effects rippling through both its built environment and its social structures. The most prominent of these shifts has been the emergence of mass urbanization, with millions of people leaving subsistence ag agriculture and moving to cities to take part in capitalist or proto-capitalist economies. Over the next 15 years, these trends will only pick up speed, with 250 million people expected to move to cities in India, roughly the same population as Indonesia, or just over seven Canada's worth of people. Or to put it another way, that's roughly half a Canada migrating to cities every year. This mass migration will only exacerbate existing pressure on Indian cities, with Delhi expected to top 38 million people, and Mumbai expected to top 28 million people by 2030. In response to these challenges, the idea of decentralized urbanism has garnered significant attention of late from policymakers, corporations, and academics alike. On one hand, in an influential 2011 report, the McKinsey Global Initiative frames decentralized urbanization as a way to transform the, quote, challenge of mass urbanization into an opportunity for profit, the growth of India's economy, the expansion of its relation to global capital, and the more effective control of its citizens. In other words, as an extremely potent vehicle for neoliberalization. On the other hand, certain urban scholars, such as Vikram Prakash, see in decentralized urbanism a chance for greater citizen involvement and more democratic control in city-making processes, finding in decentralization something potentially liberating. So what exactly does this decentralization look like in practice? In order to gain a better grasp of the dynamics involved, we must first revisit the geographic tendencies mentioned previously of a simultaneous expansion and fragmentation, developing each of these through ideas and examples in India. The first of the two, expansion, can be seen as an outgrowth of or elaboration on previous studies of polycentric urbanism in lieu of the centralized city of the pre-industrial era or the distributed model of core and suburban forms. The polycentric model instead eschews the idea of a singular center altogether, instead taking the form of a web or network of many differentiated interdependent centers. As Neil Brenner notes, this results in an erosion of traditional binaries and conceptions of the city, while as Rem Kolhas observes, the dynamics of this web of development are fundamentally different, but moving opportunistically toward points of freedom, cheapness, easy access, or diminished contextual nuisance. In practice, what this often means is a tight link between urban form and infrastructure, in which major corridors to heavily inflect the placement of these centers. These infrastructural corridors typically link large megacenters, as in India's golden quadrilateral of Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, and Chennai. Hence, what results is a hybrid form, more like something that you see on the bottom left there, uh, fluidly blending corridor, polycentric, and distributed logics, all the while deeply embedded within this notion of a networked or relational urbanism. Uh, Corridor-based plans are at the heart of the Indian government's main urban initiatives currently, specifically the Modi government's proposal to develop 100 smart cities between and atop ex India's existing urban centers, or the 2007 plan for the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, linking India's two largest economic and population hubs. So this is just a slightly larger example of um, where you can see the golden quadrilateral laid out there, and then the small black dots are the locations of the proposed smart cities. So while it doesn't perfectly track the, um, the golden quadrilateral itself, um, they tend to track major infrastructural links between different cities or between hinterlands and cities. The um, Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor is sort of the first initiative within this larger framework, um, and has already seen a huge amount of attention and development from 
as you can see in the graphic on the right there, uh, the involvement of many international firms with very familiar names to all of us. So in both cases here, we see novel models of basically ter territorial expansion of the city. The second tendency, fragmentation, often takes the form of the zone, specifically as variations on the archetypes of the special economic zone or the gated community. Describing the zone as a particularly potent spatial software, Keller Easterling traces the evolution of zones from their early manifestations as ports, export processing zones, or industrial zones, to their contemporary manifestations, which increasingly blur the line between zone and city, still retaining the legal logic of exception and the spatial format of the bounded enclave, Contemporary zone cities take on a multitude of functions, from cyber cities to knowledge parks to tourism zones to call center communities to many, many more. Uh, from its introduction in, in 1965 at Kandla Freeport in Gujarat, uh, zones in India have metastasized, proliferating throughout the country as the urban format of choice for multi -corpora multinational corporations seeking to do business in India. This logic of fragmentation and exception is not without its drawbacks and detractors, however. Building upon Stephen Graham and Simon Marvin's notion of a splintering urbanism, scholars in India have documented the emergence of a parallel enclave urbanism, which they term bypass urbanism, bearing a distinct resemblance to white flight in North America and following World War II. Bypass urbanism is seen as an abandonment of the existing city in favor of elite, exclusive enclaves. Liberalization's influx of capital and global connection has generated new publics in India, which in turn have sought new types of space up to par with their world-class desires. And you'll see this idea of world class coming back quite a bit, both just in, in the rhetoric of these proposals and in the rhetoric of people in India as well. So uh, two key examples of this pattern are Dolera, which is a special economic zone in Gujarat, it's sort of Modi's pet project before he was elected prime minister of India, and Lavasa, a residential enclave in Maharashtra. Um, in the case of, let's see, in the case of Dolera, the project is an elaboration of the special economic zone model overlaid with a fixation on making a clear, as clear a break as possible from the image of the megacity, as you can see in the expressways, golf courses, new age airports, and other things from the promo video. Um, Dolera tar targets foreign direct investment by projecting the image of an ahistorical, ageographic space, devoid of cultural speci specificity, yet replete with world-class signifiers. Um, much as Dolera is the outcome of economic shifts following liberalization, Lavasa is the outcome of commensurate cultural shifts, specifically the emerging class of young, urban, middle-class Indians and their desires for world-class living environments. Uh, modeled directly off of the hill stations of the British Raj, uh, Lavasa pitches a sanitized, exclusive urbanism on a remote greenfield site in a key location halfway between Mumbai and Pune. Despite the escapist desires of the backers of Dolera and Lavasa, both cities have run aground against democratic processes, protests, and regulations. As it turns out, what are often pitched as blank slates are not so blank after all. Um, to return to the model, combined with the smart city plans and the Modi administration, elite new towns like Dolera and Lavasa can be seen to prefigure a particular urban and cultural model for India, one based in territorial expansion and local fragmentation. In this atomized urbanism, the city is displaced by a patchwork mesh of specialized, differentiated, interdependent enclaves. These enclaves are linked into a larger network by virtue of necessity. Their specialization drives a networked interdependence. Knowledge work, manufacturing, education, tourism, recreation, and more, these functions, once constituent components of a singular metropolis, are now zoned in both senses of the term, placed into spatially separate, yet logistically and infrastructurally interlinked urbanism on a much larger territorial scale. Thus, the city has exploded in multiple senses of the word as a sudden dramatic spatial expansion, as a splintering of constituent components, and as a change with the potential, effects of, the potential for violent effects on the existing. So where does this leave us as designers? To revisit the foundational questions behind this forum and this session, what implications do these new urban and cultural patterns have for the designer, the architect, or the planner? How might we begin to construct a new engagement with them? Or as Neil Brenner asks, how might new forms of citizenship be constructed that empower people collectively to appropriate, transform, and reshape the common space of the world? With Brenner's question in mind, I wanted to close on a somewhat more speculative note by briefly turning to a selection of projects from Sala's Chandigarh Study Abroad Studio led this past fall by Professor John Bass, who actually presented just yesterday. 
Uh, specifically, several of the projects centered on strategies that explicitly link the architectural and territorial scales, acting in ways both formal and systematic, both local and networked, both architectural and infrastructural. Likewise, they directly engage the specificities of the cultural dynamics at play in these environments, as documented through extensive research and field study. This combination of a scalar multiplicity and a cultural specificity begins to form the outlines of a retroactive hypothesis on how we might address conditions of atomized urbanism. The first of these, mutualism, uh, focuses on finding ways to hitch a ride, so to speak, on the extension of premium infrastructures into new territories, constructing new forms of mutualistic inter exchange and interchange between individuals of different social groups. The second project develops a system to reconcile the desire for formal order with the reality of informal use, allowing otherwise marginalized, precarious activities a stable space. The third, hybridization, fosters density and heterogeneity through the grafting together of programs, in this case, slum rehabilitation housing, IT training facilities, and knowledge industry workspaces. And the fourth, bordering, uses architecture to redefine and renegotiate the limit of the zone, constructing new relationships between zone and hinterland, inside and outside, urban and rural, and many more. Taken together, these strategies gesture toward the possibility of new models, new modes of design, grounded in a renewed attention to the complexities of how difference is inscribed and negotiated in space. New models that, um, sorry, new models that embrace rather than reject informality, that willingly accept a degree of indeterminacy, that create inventive hybrid architectures, and that operate fluidly on multiple scales, harnessing effects of agglomeration and networked connection. In short, an architecture that responds directly and inventively to the condition of atomized urbanism. Thank you.